Let us call this meeting to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Good evening, everyone. Yes, um, I will begin with Director Gould. He was also traveling <laughs> and may have dropped off. Mm -hmm. All right, skipping Director Gould, Director Orzali, have you joined us by chance? All right, Director Wood. Here. Sheets. Present. Kelly. Present. Jones. Here. White. Here. Clark. Present. And Director Gould, I do see that you've joined us. Can you yep. hear us okay? Yep. Sure. I'm Thank here. You. It kicked me off as soon as you started the roll call. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Um, President Sailors, turning it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Tonight, after we say the pledge, if we can stay standing for a moment of silence to honor Captain Max Fortuna, the Stockton firefighter, and also Captain Mac Brabo, the Cal Fire um, captain who passed away untimely. Um, so if we can have the pledge to the flag and then a moment of silence afterwards. <clears throat> I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the United, of the United States of America, America. And, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice, justice for all. all. Thank you. The Metro Cable Announcement. The open session meeting is videotaped for Cablecast on Metro Cable 14, replayed on Monday, February 14th at 6 p.m. and Wednesday, February 16th at 9 a.m. on Channel 14, webcast at Metro 14 Live SACCounty.net. We now have the public opportunity to discuss matters of public interest within the district's jurisdiction, including items on or not on the agenda. Do we have any speakers tonight? Good evening. I did have uh, um, one person reach out, um, Mr. Tom Argel. If he's on the call, um, I know that Art is going to be unmuting everyone. I do see him as an attendee. He's been identified. I will remind everyone that you have three minutes this evening to um, give your comment. And Mr. Argel, if you're ready, we can begin with you. Well, good evening, everybody, and President Sailors, board members, Chief Arms. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to allow me to speak tonight um, in regards to the uh, 911 ambulance surge agreement. Um, I wanted to mention this because uh, beginning the end of August, actually, I received a call from um, uh, Chief Rodriguez at a consumer's fire requesting ambulance surge protection because of the system overload. And uh, that evening we couldn't participate, but soon thereafter, the 2nd of September, uh, the three ambulance, private ambulance providers in Sacramento County as well as the four fire chiefs in uh, Sacramento County met to discuss an ambulance surge agreement. And beginning in September uh, of 2021, L4 Ambulance, Medic Ambulance and American Medical Response have been providing surge protection to the district uh, upon request. And uh, over that period of time, uh, we had an agreement that we would discuss some operational logistics on radio communications, um, how the system would be activated and those type of things. As far as the billing that each provider would be responsible for the billing on their own, a fee for service, if you will. 
And uh, since the beginning of the September to today, Alpha One has responded to approximately 44 calls and transported 29 patients. So a pretty low number uh, of requests to transports. And while all the private providers are uh, willing to help whenever possible and assist in the community whenever we can, uh, we want to continue doing so. Um, I recently had the opportunity to review the um, ambulance surge agreement and found a section in that agreement to be very concerning. And that agreement, uh, section six, uh, it described an exclusive operating area and prohibited um, Alpha One or any other private ambulance provider uh, from responding into the district if we sign this uh, surge agreement. And while that cannot be done, uh, we would we won't be able to sign that agreement with the with that section in place on the exclusivity or the um, restrictions of Alpha One responding within the district. We want to continue providing services as we have been, but we would like to remove that language. And we would certainly like to discuss um, more of a protocol driven agreement where we discuss radio communications, scene management, how we activate the services, um, posting locations. Uh, those are the things that we would like to continue a dialogue with. But at this point, uh, we cannot continue to sign an agreement with those restrictions. And if we were to do that, uh, with the number of calls that the private providers are responding within the district, we anticipate that the district would have to add an additional eight ambulances to an already stressed system if we were not allowed to continue providing those services. So I know the firefighter paramedics are um, extremely fatigued right now with everything that's going on and to prohibit us from responding would add more uh, stress and reduce the morale and it would just cause additional hardship to the community, your constituents and the firefighters as well. And of course our paramedics as well because we would have to have a reduction in force if we were to reduce our ambulance coverage within that area. In Alpha One, we staff up about 27 ambulances at peak. So we have a, a very large presence in Sacramento County and we are following the uh, local EMS um, agency's um, EMS plan when it comes to how we provide the advanced life support, emergency, non-emergency responses in Sacramento County. And that plan has been approved by the state EMS authority. So all of the responses that we are, uh, the business that we're conducting in Sacramento County has been approved by the state of California and by the local emergency medical service agency in Sacramento County. So in closing, I would like to um, request that we um, either completely remove the agreement as it stands and then collaborate with the providers, the public and private providers at a future time to work through more of a protocol driven agreement rather than a, a legal document preventing us from providing service. So that is my ask and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Argel. Does anyone uh, have any questions? I do, well, not really a question, but this is Director White. Thank you, Mr. The, uh, sorry, a point of clarification in that section six, that exclusivity is meant to mean that while you are working for the district, in a surge protection capacity that you're exclusively working for the district, that you're not also dispatching yourself or doing inter-facility transfers. That was my understanding. I'm kind of seeking clarification on that. I didn't see that as, you know, you couldn't run calls in the system, but that if you are operating in a, in a capacity of surge protection, you are working exclusively for the district, you would be dispatched by the district and not be uh, conduct in other interfacility transports or or dispatching yourself, therefore not truly being available for that surge protection. Now, that's my question. I'm just kind of seeking clarification on that. That was my understanding of the agreement. Thank you, Chief White, for that clarification. Um, I think in that plain language that you just described, might be something to consider. Uh, the way it's described in the agreement, 
I don't read it that way, but if you want to readdress it in plain language, uh, be more than happy to present it to the other providers and uh, see if that uh, has any uh, change in our position with the exclusivity and restriction of responding in the district. Chief Harms. Director White, we have a presentation that is coming up on that in which we'll go through the whole agreement and maybe that will help answer those questions at that time when we do the actually I think it yeah it's a presentation item then we'll come back next month as an action item. Thank you. I appreciate that. Chief Harms, did I hear you say it was coming up next month? Yeah, today is a presentation item on the uh, agenda, and then it will be voted on on the next. Once we take comments back, then it will be adjusted as needed. And then the second meeting in February, this will be an action item. I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Harms. Does anyone else have any other questions about this item? Seeing no hands raised. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ardrill, for your uh, comments. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Moving on, the next item is the consent items. Before we begin, we are going to move item number two from the consent agenda to the action area. It will become item number three in the action. So, that only leaves one item on the consent agenda, the action summary minutes. I will take- Madam Chair, Yes. this is Director Gould. Can you hear me? Yes, you are loud and clear. I, okay, good. I, I think in order for us to move an item off consent to an action item this evening, we need to actually have a motion that makes it an emergency procedure that there be some kind of reasoning for pulling it off consent and putting it on action. It, it, we have to do that through a separate action item. I, if I understand the, the policies of the organization, you may want to check with our attorney. But I think in order for us to do that and take action tonight, we have to first make a motion to pull it under some extenuating circumstance. Council Lavra. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not aware of the extenuating circumstance. It is best practice, however, to um, have a motion to have that item removed from consent and placed on the action item agenda. So I Madam Chair, Madam. With, with, yeah, with that insight, then I would suggest that I make a motion that we move item number two on the consent agenda to the uh, action item list as item number three uh, for this evening. And it would be uh, interesting if we could hear, prior to the motion being voted on, if we could hear some type of uh, explanation of why at this late hour that document is being moved for action. Thank you for that explanation, uh, Director Gould. Um, I have some concerns about moving some of the positions on the pad um, and in actual detail, removing um, a fire inspector position when the actual inspectors are kind of overworked. Why are we removing one of their positions when in essence, we don't have enough of them to do the workload that they have? Um, I would like us to hear more about the reasoning to lose one of those positions. Um, and I would like the board to hear more reasons on why they should lose one of their positions. Well then president, I made the motion to move it to action. It sounds like it may be something that you'd like to have presented and discussed under presentation items, potentially uh, avoiding a action item this evening. Is yes. that what you're hoping for? Uh, that was what I originally asked for and was told that it could go straight to an action item. I'm still learning many things about okay. the process. Well, well the, the, the bottom, 
the bottom line is it can be moved to action upon motion, a seconded motion and a majority vote of the a board. So that can be done tonight. And then it's discussed as an action item, whether or not it's passed or passed in some other form or removed for further consideration. That's something that can be taken up when it's called as an right. action item. Well, then my motion stands if we wanna take action tonight for some reason, then I, I, my motion stands to take it off consent and move it to full action this evening. Madam Chair, my name is Matt Kelly and I second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Director Kelly. Um, Madam Clerk, we have a motion and a second. Director Gould. Aye. Director Orzelli, have you joined us? Director Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. So this will be heard as an action item this evening. I'll um, label it as action item number three and I believe we have Deputy Chief Bailey ready to speak on that when we do get to that action item. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I move the remainder of the consent agenda. Second. Thank you very much. I have a motion for and a second on the consent agenda. Can Madam Clerk, can you call the roll, please? Director Gould. Aye. Wynn. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Moving on to the presentation items. Number one, Firefighters Burn Institute. Um, Joe Pick. Good evening, uh, Board of Directors, uh, Chief. Uh, thank you for giving me a time to uh, speak to you today. My name is Joe Pick. I'm the Executive Director of the Firefighters Burn Institute. I'm a, a retired fire captain from Metro Fire and um, a member of your district as well uh, in the Carmichael area. I'd like to start off uh, today by announcing that uh, Chief Harms uh, did win the Chief's Challenge for our boot drive. Uh, he has been the reigning champion. Uh, he brought in $13,000 into our uh, boot drive. Um, his uh, motivation to start preloading the boot has been gathering traction. Uh, Folsom got very involved with a $7,000 uh, um, um, donation. And for that Chief's Challenge, for that one hour, uh, we raised twenty-seven thousand dollars for the firefighters boot, uh, firefighters burn institute boot drive. Um, I'm very appreciative to Metro Fire as being a member of Metro Fire for many years, uh, and again living in this district. Um, I, I'm appreciative to all the support that we got from uh, Metro Fire, from the logistics side to the fleet side and facilities. Um, we could not have this event if it weren't for uh, uh, Metro Fire participation and support. Um, the, the firefighters, I would like to recognize the firefighters that you have uh, working for you. These guys and gals are working 96 hour uh, work day, work weeks. Um, their call volume is increasing significantly and yet they were out there in force uh, supporting us and supporting what we do at the Firefighters Burn Institute. So I'm very proud of our organization and I wanted to communicate that to you. Um, I do have two stories that I would like to tell you that came to me in the course of the four days that we were out there. Uh, one started a little bit beforehand and it's a recognition of the crews at Station 21. There was a gentleman by the name of Larry White who was, according to 21, was a regular for them. The gentleman had MS um, and frequently they went to his house to do lift, uh, uh, lift assists for him. Um, 
the family was overwhelmed by the kindness, compassion, and professionalism that they um, that they provided for Larry, and just to to finer details of making sure that his um, his clothing was uh, cleaned and his bedding was cleaned when he would have uh, have an accident um, and putting it in the wash and um, just being kind humans and good firefighters and taking care of the community. Um, we started getting donations uh, in honor of Larry White and I had no idea who that individual was. So I had to do some research. Um, I will tell you that the connection that I had was his daughter was a burn nurse at UC Davis for many years. And his son-in-law was the first person I ever went to a Grateful Dead show with uh, many years ago in the 80s. Uh, we've maintained friendship for a long time, um, but I had no idea what that connection was. So I reached out to the family and I reached out to the crews at 21 and found out that the crews at 21 invited him uh, to dinner at, at 21. He was a history teacher at Sierra College um, and uh, as a history buff, uh, presented a flag, a, uh, a military type flag that flies in station uh, 21 in their weight room. And the family was just so impressed and overwhelmed with the support they got from the firefighters and Metro Fire that they asked for, uh, in lieu of flowers, all donations uh, go to the Firefighters Burn Institute. And I just, um, it just reflects that that ripple effect makes a difference. Uh, the men and women that you have working for you at Metro Fire, um, despite the amount of hours and the call volume, are still uh, providing a professional, kind, compassionate level of service. And I couldn't be more uh, proud of them. I later found out uh, that uh, there was another story that came up uh, from the crews at 105. It was the Stewart family and uh, talking to the crews at 105, they were familiar with that family, an elderly family and their uh, a couple in their 90s. And they responded to a medical aid at, that, uh, at their house um, because they were in their turnouts for that call. They tracked in mud into their white carpets. And after they transported uh, the, the husband, they came back, gathered up their house fund and uh, gave it to the Stewart uh, family uh, to help them clean their carpets because they'd left their, their carpets. Um, again, I call that the campground rule. We leave it better than we found it. And they came back and donated or gave them that money. Um, these, these, this couple who I've spoken with, and this story has actually made, made the news, uh, were so overwhelmed with the generosity from the Metro Fire crews that they said, we, we want to donate this money. And so they donated it to the Firefighters Burn Institute, which uh, allowed me to open a door and speak to them about what we do and what our organization is. Um, again, I just want to give a shout out to our men and women that are on the front lines, uh, working through a pandemic, working through brownouts, working through mandatories, uh, not being able to get home to see their family and yet providing that level of service. Um, so again, I couldn't be more, more proud of them. Um, and also as an organization, as the Firefighters Burn Institute, we're going on 49 years that we've been around and what I want to communicate to the board is our commitment to servicing our burn community, whether it's firefighter, civilian, uh, child, or uh, adult. Um, anybody that suffers from a burn injury and ends up in either Shriners or the Firefighters Burn Institute, Regional Burn Center at UC Davis, um, we are there to support them. Um, our LRT program that we gear specifically to supporting firefighters um, has been very successful, and we have just recently uh, assisted a Metro firefighter of working through the process of getting into UC Davis, getting into the clinic, getting that follow-up appointment, 
And for us as an organization, that's uh, what we want to do, but we couldn't do it without our community support. So I thank you. I thank the board. I thank Chief Harms. And I thank the firefighters that are out in the streets doing their job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pick. It's a great job that the burn center does for everyone at the, that goes in for burn treatments down there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Mr. Pick? Seeing no hands. Um, just okay. a comment. Yeah, yeah. I truly appreciate okay. the work of the Firefighter Burn Institute. You know, I'm not just ensuring that highest burn care treatment be available here in Sacramento, but just the work you do with burn survivors through the burn survivor camp for kids and the adult retreats. You know, there's a psychological factor when you talk about burns and the Burn Institute does an incredible job of assisting burn victims with developing that positive outlook on life. And I just really appreciate the work you do. And then just for clarification, who, who came in third in the Chiefs Challenge this year? Uh, it, was, it, it wasn't you because you weren't there. Uh, I, but. <laughs> first, day, so first year, I didn't come in the top three. So that's. Yeah, I, I, I believe CSD was third. Folsom was second. Um, uh, they, they got engaged. Um, so uh, the support from our chiefs and being able to communicate to them uh, the resources we have available to their crews. Um, so yes, it was uh, Metro, Consumers, and then Folsom. I, and I also want to not only congratulate, but thank Chief Arms for raising the bar when it comes to Chief's Challenge. It wasn't that many years ago, and I think 4,000 would have taken it, but you know, the C13,000 collected is, is pretty remarkable. So congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? Seeing no hands, I shall move on to the next presentation item. 15 years of service to Director Clark. Unbelievable. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations on 15 years as a member of the Metro Board. You have been in just a number of positions. And if you reflect back over the 15 years, that is quite the ride, as you have seen lots of changes during your time. Uh, for me as Fire Chief, though, over the last five plus years, you have been uh, a steady supporter. Um, you really have a great um, view of the district. And then I think your past history with labor and labor relations really helps round things out. So I would like to say personally, thank you for your commitment and also to the, from the community, 15 years and being reelected and going through that is absolutely outstanding. So congratulations. And we have a pin for you. So hopefully soon we'll be in person and we can give you that pin really soon. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, there it is. See the pin? Yeah, I see it. <laughs> yeah. I'll be in tomorrow. I'll be in to pick it up tomorrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good for you, Delman. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. Congrats, Delman. Uh, um, honestly, I, I, this was a surprise. I wasn't even thinking about that, and I saw it on the agenda, and I was really, uh, I was really shocked. Uh, Fifteen years. It seems like it was just not that long ago when I came on the board. I was appointed. And um, then uh, we went through a, we were going through a lot of turmoil in, in the district. And it was like, it, like the chief said, I've been through a lot, uh, a lot of changes. And, and I, I'm so blessed and so uh, uh, overwhelmed at the support over the years with of the, all of my fellow directors. This, these are guys, these are top notch people. This is a wonderful organization, um, Local 522. Is a, is a great group of guys to work with, men and women to work to work with. And uh, above all, I, I thank the uh, constituents of uh, Division Six for, uh, for their support. And uh, I just wanna continue uh, making this organization one of the finest in the state of California, if not, if not the planet. So thank you all for your support and uh, um, I'm so, so, like I said, blessed. It's an honor and a pleasure. 
to be a part of this organization as and the board of um, being on the board of directors. That's all I have. Congratulations, Director Clark. I know 15 years, four actually really good ones too, I know, but uh, <laughs> yeah. no, uh, it's quite an accomplishment, but uh, you know, I got to work for the district as you, with you as a director and now to serve on the board as a colleague with you is an honor. I just want to say congratulations. It's quite a commitment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Director Clark. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to add or say, or should we move on? Seeing no hands. Moving on to presentation item number three, 911 Ambulance Surge Protection Agreement. Assistant Chief Law. Good evening, directors. Um, I'm just waiting for um, Art to pull up my presentation. Is everyone seeing that now? Because I'm just seeing you. Mm, right now, we just see everyone. We see you oh, too. Here it comes. There there it is. Is. Excellent. <laughs> We're off to a running start. Um, good evening, directors. I'm Barbie Law. I'm your assistant chief of emergency medical services, and I'm here tonight to um, provide an overview of the emergency ambulance surge protection agreement that was included as a presentation item for you tonight in your board packet. Um, next slide, please, Art. So my objectives this evening are to provide you just a broad overview and background on the need that we have currently for an additional ambulance surge protection capacity locally here um, within Metro Fire's jurisdiction. Um, I'd like to explain the intent of the agreement and then uh, briefly go over the vendor qualification procedure that we're going to follow. Um, next slide. So just a little bit of background um, to refresh everyone's memory here. Um, as we're all aware, and, and um, as Joe Pick also uh, touched on, we have been in experiencing an increase in call volume here locally um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, specifically with the two surges now that we've had with Delta and Omicron. Um, but not only that, we've had an increase in call volume, uh, just not related to COVID at all, just urgent um, increased medical needs in the community. Um, going along with this, we've experienced an unprecedented rise in hospital bed delays um, in offloading our patients at the emergency room. Um, and when that happens, it has a, a trickle down effect out in the community with response times and units available to respond to calls. Um, so with that, we have been regularly engaging all of our automatic aid agreements with the surrounding local fire agencies that also provide 911 ambulance service. Um, we are a boundary list system, as you know, and so um, uh, routinely we're exhausting those automatic aid options. Um, from there, we move into uh, activating our in-service reserve medics, and we've been um, frequently having to activate those units as well, um, which I think is a benefit to the district that we have the ability to provide this. We are the only fire agency in the region that has this um, capacity right now, um, but there are drawbacks with that as well, um, because we do have to take a suppression company out of service to cross stuff that ambulance and go run that call. Um, so whenever possible, we would uh, choose to not have to do that. Um, we've also been going through our additional capacity with our AMR um, response partners. So not only are all of the units that are normally part of our system engaged and actually running calls, um, they've provided us everything else that they can to assist with the call boost, um, but then they're uh, out of options as well. Um, so when we get to that point, um, 219 times since August, so since that Delta surge really kicked off, we've had to look to uh, additional options for response to 911 calls. Um, and so this has happened 219 times um, since August. Um, the majority of those calls have been handled um, by AMR with additional units that they flushed into the system. So 187 of those calls were handled by AMR. But on 32 occasions, we had to reach out to other qualified private ambulance companies in the area 
to have them um, provide some assistance to respond to calls. So um, 32 times since August, we've actually had um, other private ambulance companies uh, assist in the system for brief periods of times to handle that call search. Um, to put this in perspective for you, um, so 32 times um, we handled over 73,000 medical aids last year. So this is actually a very small proportion of our calls, but nonetheless, the, the need uh, is there. Next slide, please. So the intent of this emergency surge protection agreement is to provide additional response capacity when all of our other surge options have been exhausted. So you can think of this as really the backup to the backup. And our, our primary backup is American Medical Response as part of our existing agreement. Uh, so we're seeking to, with this agreement, basically establish a list of qualified approved advanced life support providers um, in Sacramento County that the communication center could turn to, to reach out for, to ask if anybody has a unit or two that they could provide to the system to assist um, during those times of just extreme call search. Um, this does not in any way replace our existing agreement with American Medical Response. They do remain our primary option for surge protection. Um, but again, there, we have identified a need for additional capacity. Um, and I think it's important to, to point out that for the district, there is no fiscal impact to this agreement. Um, the providers that come in and run calls would actually be doing their own billing for any transport and service that they provide. So uh, unlike the current AMR agreement, we will not be paying a unit hour cost. Rather, the people that respond will do their own um, cost recovery through their normal processes. Uh, next slide, please. So now as far as the, the vendor qualification procedure, uh, this is going to be a little bit different than perhaps what you're familiar with. Um, purchasing is going to be posting a vendor qualification application on the district's website. Um, this will actually be an open filing um, with no expiration date, uh, which I think will be beneficial um, because if other companies come into the area in the future that are approved ALS providers by Sacramento County. Um, if they so choose, they could also um, seek to sign on to this agreement, which would give us further options in the future. So there's no expiration date on that qualification application. Um, and then to become qualified, uh, purchasing will basically be verifying um, once they've received the application from a vendor that they actually have all of the necessary um, local licenses and permits and certifications needed um, to provide ambulance service. Um, in addition, we'll be checking to see that they have a um, current written ALS agreement um, with Sacramento County EMS Agency. Uh, we'll be verifying that they have all of the necessary insurances. Um, and then finally, we'll need to be checking that they're not on the uh, OIG exclusion list. Um, and this is just related to federal health care mandates. We are a, a provider of services for Medicare and Medicaid patients, and that's a, a routine uh, background check and safety that's in place that we run all of our people through on a monthly basis. And anybody that um, we have agreements with should have a similar uh, process in place. So that really provides a broad overview of what this agreement is, is going to be doing for us. And at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, before, before we go to this, this is Chief Harms. Just a, a couple of things. Chief Law, thank you for doing the presentation. Um, as, as she had said, uh, since August, there has been 32 times where we've asked other private agencies to come in and respond and assist um, no, 32 calls that they have ran on and, and assist during that time. Uh, as you see on the, the agreement here, it is a lot of things that while we have operational ways of doing these things, and I think we have a very good operational plan, there's an administrative side of it that I think is very important that we go through and identify uh, with this agreement all the administrative sides that have to be done. Uh, one of the questions that came up was about exclusivity. And within our contract, much similar to the contract that we have for surge protection with AMR, we have a portion in there that provides for exclusivity in there. Um, while this may have been a concern for maybe one of the 
um, ambulance providers. There are other ambulance providers that are in the region that have an opportunity to be able to uh, add on to this, or as other ones come into the system down the road, there is uh, additional opportunities for that too. One of the things in conversations has been really as we look at our ambulance system and the deployment of them, uh, obviously the pandemic has at times pushed us, but uh, through ourselves and with uh, Labor 522 and the other departments, I see in 22 of us taking a look at this system and, and looking at what are the best practices here and other places and being able to expand those as we move forward also. So if, uh, thank you Chief Law for letting me in there. Now, if anybody has any questions. Chief, I have a quick question. It's Director sure. Gould. Uh, first, thank you, Chief Law, for that presentation. And thank you, Chief, for clarifying some things uh, on questions that I had since I was the one that pulled it from consent. I appreciate the opportunity, one, to allow our uh, community constituents to provide their insight and input. And, um, and then the clarification that came from tonight's presentation, I think that is so important that people in the community and our other stakeholders understand what we mean when we say we're looking at a surge protection agreement. I, I think that that's something that we're all familiar with and understand that maybe the rest of the community uh, doesn't. So thanks for that presentation tonight. Um, based on what we heard this evening from at least one speaker, I would just ask that as we move this policy forward, this agreement forward, and we come to some resolution on it, that, that we also then report back to the the directors say in 60 days of how many people have even taken advantage of this. As we heard tonight, the idea was that if we move it forward, there may be an unwillingness in our local provider groups to sign that agreement. And it would just be good to get some kind of an update in 60 days of whether that in fact has come to fruition. And now we have an agreement standing out there with no one signing on, which could be a challenge for us. So if I could just ask uh, the president and others, to, as we move this forward to action item in the, in the next meeting, that we look at some kind of a system where we get a report back to see if in fact the agreement has been effectuated by local providers. Thank you. Thank you, Director Gould. Um, so chief, is there a way to do that? Oh, definitely. We'd be able to, to report back and let you know I'll, we can work with purchasing on that as they're the ones that would be receiving the applications. So that wouldn't be a problem at all. Thank you very much for that. Um, does anyone else have any comments or questions? I, ca I can't. We have a split screen, so I can only see like four of us. Oh, there you go. There Thank, you. Go. Thank you. Um, seeing no other hands. No comments or questions. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chief Law, for that wonderful presentation and the clarification that it brings for everyone. Um, we shall now move on to action items. The first action item is uh, FY 2019 Homeland Security Grant Program, Urban Area Security Initiative, the UASI Grant Acceptance. Erin Castleberry, sounds like good. it's one of yours. Good evening, directors. Thank you um, for your time tonight. I'm happy to be here to uh, present a grant award that we were notified that we received. Um, last year, we submitted a grant application as part of the State Homeland Security Grant Program to Sacramento OES. And one of the applications that we submitted was for a hazmat uh, trace detection analyzer. Unfortunately, this was not funded in the Shishgap program. So we actually resubmitted this request under the UASI program, which is the Urban Area Security Initiative. That's handled by a slightly different group, um, the Sacramento Metropolitan Urban Area Working Group handles the UASI grants from FEMA. And that is sponsored by um, the sponsoring agency that administers those funds is the City of Sacramento Police Department. 
So we did get a chance to resubmit this application under the UASI program, and it was funded in the amount of $105,000. And so we bring that award to you tonight for acceptance. I'll take any questions if you have them. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Seeing no hands, no questions. Thank you, Aaron. And you are up for our next action item, notice of award 908 device. I, th I think we need to take a vote. Take yeah. a vote on it. Yeah, we got a vote. Thank you. Thank you. M Madam Chair, this is Director Jones. Okay. I move the uh, first action item of our staff recommendation on I'll a second plan. Thank you. I'll I'll second. Second. Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. Director Gould. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. Ann Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Ms. Castleberry, I was just going to have you do them both and then have us roll vote. right through. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, item number two. Sure. I'm so um, in light of the award that you just accepted, we would um, bring to you this um, bid award to 908 Devices is the name of the vendor. Um, our hazmat team identified this equipment um, which is a, hopefully I say it right, here we go, portable high pressure mass spectrometer. I think I said that right. Um, the benefit of this particular product is that it is the only high pressure mass spectrometer available that um, tracks at trace levels, um, as opposed to visible levels, um, chemicals, including chemical weapons, toxic industrial chemicals, and even um, nerve agents. So it is a multi-use, um, multi-hazard detection tool. There is one of these tools already in the area. I believe Sacramento Fire Department has one. So the addition of this resource to our area definitely increases uh, response capacity for hazmat in the area. This particular device um, is a sole source request and that is due to the fact that this device is the only handheld device available on the market. That's important because as you know, our team is moving around a lot and some of the other equipment is very cumbersome to move around um, and not very useful in the field. So this is a totally field deployable tool and um, therefore this is the recommended product by the HAZMAT team. The um, total cost is $103,205, which is 100% covered by the Yoasi grant. There is no match on that grant. So there is no fiscal impact to us. We recommend that the board approve this bid award so we can move forward with the purchase. I'll take any questions if you have them. Thank you, Ms. Castleberry. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Seeing no hands. I'll Wait, I, I'd like to ask Ms. Castleberry. Go ahead. Please Kelly. explain all the specifications of this spectrometer. <laughs> no, well, I, I, Kelly, I, I did. I all the staff report, so I would direct you to that. I, thank you for your presentation. Thank Madam you. Chair, this is Director Jones. I'd like to move the item, please. Thank I'll you. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Go ahead and call the roll, please. Director Gould. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Ms. Castleberry. Our next item on the action list is item number three, the PAD. Chief Bailey. 
This has been sent to you. Good evening, Board of Directors. Yeah, so um, we are seeking board approval for the positions authorization document. And through this request, there are several different areas. What I like to do is walk you through each of those items. And then specifically the uh, question that you had with the inspector moving to a new position, I will pass that to Chief Wagaman and Chief Barsdell because that is in their respective divisions and they are prepared to answer those questions. Um, so there's several different areas. A lot of it was clean up, uh, converting one vacant fire inspector, which we will sp uh, speak on a little bit later to a fire investigator too. Um, and then we have firefighter positions that have been updated reflecting the 21 safer grant positions that need to be added to our PAD as part of that acceptance of funding. And then also some miscellaneous changes. So um, first in the office of the fire chief, 522 vice president, um, we switched that from Mike McGoldrick to battalion chief Matt Cole, who is now the vice president. And then operations, we had some cleanup with names of newly promoted battalion chiefs. Uh, engineer vacancies, we reduced what's authorized to what's currently filled, and that will change uh, at the end of this next promotional test that's currently happening. Um, and like I said, we have the 21 new positions. Uh, also, the single role paramedic captains name changes due to reclassification. Single role paramedics and EMTs, we changed the actual fill positions uh, just due to the hiring that we're currently um, in the current um, positions that are currently being hired. Uh, support services. So we have one that moved from days to suppression, uh, reclassifying the inspector. And then also when you, in the administration, the deputy chief position that I am currently filled had Chief Cassantini in that position, uh, our new hire, Dave Tool as the CFO. Um, Business Applications Analysts, we hired Marquise Tucker. And lastly, the MIH program, we added two new uh, physician assistants from four to six. Uh, and that's based on the minimal amount of hours that they are able to work. And those changes are not an increase to the budget. They are all 100% funded through the grant. So that's the basics to all the changes that we uh, made. Uh, everyone in HR, finance, Sarah Ortiz assisted with that as well as Laura Kelly. We actually went five years back through the PADs and did a lot of cleanup, just making sure that all the numbers that we currently have are accurate. So I want to thank everyone that helped out with that process. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask Chief Wagaman and Chief Barsdell, who I believe Chief Barsdell is with us as well. Chief Wagaman. You want to speak on behalf of CRRD? Sure. Thank you, Chief Bailey and uh, President uh, Sailors. Good evening. Uh, I appreciate your question. And, and I, too, um, am concerned about the work volume that we have across all positions throughout our district. There is a lot of work to be done and just not a lot of people to get all that work done. Um, one of the things that we did is I sat down with Chief Barsdale many months ago, and we looked at all the positions that are filled as well, as well as the ones that are not filled. And uh, Chief Barsdale explained that there is a position, uh, one of her inspector positions, that she has been challenged with getting filled for quite some time. And I'll have her go into a little bit additional detail on that. Uh, but before I do that, um, we talked about moving this position to an investigator position. Uh, in the form of a pilot program. Really, the thought is if we knew we could fill a fire investigator position and challenged with filling an inspector position, can we get more of the district's work done for our constituents? So we wanted to give that a shot. So I came before you prior to July, uh, and in the, I believe it was a presentation. I spoke about a pilot program for our arson investigators where we fortunately very lucky to have a firefighter who is a fully post qualified in law enforcement uh, and he worked um, moved over to our investigations bureau and worked as an investigator for six months july through december again this was a pilot program 
And this allowed our fire investigating supervisor, Chris Rogers, to move to days. As you can imagine, as a supervisor working shift work, it's very difficult to oversee the three adjacent shifts when you're on one of them yourselves. So this allowed Chris to oversee these three shifts while working a day assignment. Uh, so pr provided additional oversight. He was able to review reports, uh, provide search capacity. We have additional investigator on during our business hours so they can go out and assist the on-duty investigator on either sentinel events, uh, fatality fires, or respond to different calls if there was more calls for service during that same time frame, They also added some consistency amongst the group, as well as provided cross-training for our fire inspectors. This was the first year that we were very successful in getting investigations training for our inspectors, and they were out in full force on July 3rd and 4th helping us out, uh, uh, providing calls uh, uh, for service throughout our district doing inspections. Uh, as well as uh, that investigator on days provides uh, the ability to do inspection warrants uh, for our community risk reduction division. So with that, uh, I hope that explains the reasoning as to why uh, we looked at this position. Again, we don't make decisions in a vacuum. We certainly wanted to try it. Uh, Chief Barsdale and I both feel that this is a has been a very, very successful program <clears throat> and we're able to get more work done by making this move. But I certainly understand um, you know, some potential challenges in any time we move these types of positions. Uh, but with that, uh, I, I do want Chief Barstill to explain some of the historicals behind this specific position and the challenge challenges that she faced over the last couple of years, uh, getting a person in the, in the spot. Chief Barstill. Good evening, directors and executive staff. Lisa Barstill, a fire marshal here at Metro Fire. Um, just a little history, in um, 2015, we began to increase our staffing within the Community Risk Reduction Division to rebuild um, the unit. Um, we started at the inspector level with an increase to 14 inspector positions. Um, that with that came additional supervisory staff um, between 2015 and 20, 2019. Um, there was an increase of uh, supervising inspector, the deputy fire marshal position was reinstituted, and with my um, promotion to fire marshal, that created three additional st spots for promotional opportunities. So over that time, we've been um, continuously recruiting for the fire inspector position. Um, there's a, a couple of things that have affected that, the interest level, um, for individuals who show up for the testing process, um, the number that make them through the process and then the hiring pro process for us to be able to fill those vacant spots. Um, in addition to that, um, our, the majority of our staff was um, close to retirement age. And what you've seen during that time is a full turnover of our staff. Um, there's one more expected retirement over the next year. And then after that, there's a four, about a four and a half year um, break before the expectation of um, other individuals moving forward with retirement. So um, we currently have three vacant positions within the division that we're actively recruiting for. Um, one of the other things that have affected our recruitment is um, the interest level expressed during COVID. So while we've had several hundred applicants to start with in the past, um, our final filing date is uh, the end of next week, and we've only received 58 applications at this time. So um, that's a significant in, uh, decrease from what we've seen in the past as well, which has been kind of the trend over the last couple of cycles. So um, we've been able to um, really assist our fire prevention staff with the implementation of the supervising inspector on days and um, really help some of those um, challenges that overlap. We see a lot of overlap um, with the homelessness creating um, fire incidents, but then also creating code enforcement and life safety issues um, on the fire and life safety side of things. So they've really been able to coordinate efforts and work very well together, um, which has allowed us to utilize one of the additional spots that we've not, we've not typically been able to fill. Um, consistently over that time, we've run one to two positions short. Mm -hmm. um, that's all I have, unless there are any questions. So 
I'm hearing that you're having the same hiring difficulty that we're having on the firefighter side. Correct. Same as suppression. Correct. And that seems to be the same for the other um, prevention and community risk divisions throughout the state as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you always only had three fire investigators? Um, we had, um, no, we have had six in the past. That was um, before uh, staffing reductions um, several years ago. Um, we are looking at analyzing um, what it takes um, time time wise per investigation to really document um, all those things that we don't see. It's not just responding to the you know just under 400 fires that they respond to to investigate, but all the time for the report writing, the follow up investigations um, when they do are able to make arrests, everything that comes along with that, and the court proceedings and whatnot. So we're really um, fine tuning and looking at some of the processes that are, um, that are um, in the investigation unit and then really getting good solid data on all the amount of time it takes for them to perform their duties and then how we can better support them in the future. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to think of ways, um, having been an investigator myself, I might be able to help you in that area. Um, but what concerns me is just the low number of employees that you have in that area. And to see you remove one instead of hiring more, that is what I find distressing. Um, Chief, do you have any comments or quest, uh, uh, suggestions? When we looked at doing this, we really, as, as Tyler said, we wanted to run a pilot and see if we could improve our capabilities. And I think that what we're bringing to you is, is that I understand your concerns, but what we were able to see, and, and let me back up a little bit more, is that in the past, fire investigations was actually managed in operations. And we moved it back over to uh, Lisa, when was that, about two years ago or three years ago, we moved it back over to, um, per, to prevention or CRRD. What we brought here is, I think, the best model for the service that we provide today. Um, statistically, we are one of the few agencies that has completed all of the mandatory um, um, uh, inspections. Uh, our members are able to look at the construction side of it. I think we have a good balance of supervision to the level of inspectors. And, and, and part of that is, is that I use the word supervision, but the support mechanism that is built into it. And then, as you know, it's, it's, it's whether it's fireworks or along the parkway, that other area and bringing it together has, has showed us during the pilot of it that it can be successful. So I am, I'm 100% supportive in being able to take this and move it forward because I think it for us shows it's the best business model for what we do here as an organization. Um, the, the models we're having and, and obviously we're going through and, and looking at some uh, professional staff positions. I think that or organizationally, whether it would be over on the mechanic side of it or that we're looking at the HR side of it, well, we run lean. But I will say one of the things that is not happening in our organization, and, and you all hear it, is that every so often we will have some challenges. And most of our challenges in CRD is based around asking somebody to do something to meet the code. And, and a lot of times it will cost money and they just don't want to do it our ability to get our work done gets done. And I feel very comfortable for being able to do that. And at this point, I would ask for you as the president of the board to support this program. And again, we will continue to look at our numbers and our ability to fill positions and making sure we're able to accomplish the work that is, um, that is determined to need to be completed in CRD moving forward um, as an organization. Do any other directors have any comments or questions? 
Yes, like Madam Director President. Jones. Yes, thank you. I have my hand raised. It's uh, okay. Um, I'm. Uh, th thank you, everybody, for for helping us uh, fill in all this incredible structure that's on the uh, uh, community risk reduction division uh, side of the house, so to speak. Now, when we mentioned, I have a question and a comment. Well, we, you mentioned the pilot program between July and December. And did the movement to a day supervisor for the inspectors, that's what occurred during that pilot project, correct? Correct. Okay. So what we have here is uh, the, the proposed PAD uh, shows that we're moving a fire inspector into fire investigator now. Um, but So that's a different pilot project. What's our timeline and what are our uh, checkoffs? So this is, this is a permanent change. So we had a uh, couple things lined up. This position has been vacant. So we were able to use the funding from this position. We had a firefighter in the field that was a certified arson investigator. So the pilot was, is we took the supervisor off shift work and made him a, a true supervisor over all three shifts and then worked to integrate him into CRD. We took the firefighter from the field and moved him over into an investigations position for six months Chief Wagaman and um, Chief Barsdale had certain goals for them to be able to do things to look at. Was this the best model for being able to move forward? What we identified was that this is the best model for moving forward. We still have the vacant uh, inspector position as, the, as was stated, this position has been vacant. So it's no longer a pilot. Through the pilot, we proved this is success is this is where we wanna go and what we need to do to provide two things. One is provide true uh, um, supervision for our inspectors that are out there and the support for them. Plus it integrates the investigations into CRRD. So now what we have is a um, supervision and integration of the two of them together for moving forward. So the pilot proved it. This is no longer a, a pilot. This is moving forward now with a uh, new PAD for being able to have a true supervisor and a investigator in CRD. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, with that being said, I can appreciate that, but I also want uh, you as fire chief and uh, Chief Wagman and Fire Marshal Bars Barsdale to know that if, you know, six months down the road or four months or whenever, if there seems to be a crunch point and an overload please come back to this board because uh, I'm sh this board I'm sure is, is more than ready to help support uh, this division. So please don't hesitate. And uh, we'll, we will work with the budget and, and find room. But uh, with, with that being said, I, I can accept what you said. Uh, I just don't want to close the door on it. If the need arises, uh, we're there to, to add additional PAD for those um, in, in, uh, inspectors. Thank you. you uh, Director Jones, you say something that was um, that was just in my mind was key, was our ability to support the, the different groups. And one of the things, and I know it has gone on, and, and Chief Wagman was involved in investigations before I got here, but one of the things that happened when I had gotten here was that that unit had been reduced and it had been disconnected from CRRD. And the supervisor... Uh, who, who was at that time, and, and it, it was a Barsdale also at that time, but he, it was very difficult to manage your shift, manage your investigations, manage what is going on for, for really your shift on, on B shift, and, but then being in charge of supervising. So there's only so much time in the day. And, and I think that's what we really, at the end of this, was heard that from his position and then as it moved forward with Chris Rogers and there is what do we do as an organization to truly provide support? Uh, and it, this is this is not driven really by Tyler or me thinking, hey, let's let's move some people around and do it. It is truly driven by uh, the investigative side of it and from Lisa and her shop saying, what can we do 
with the staffing we have and what's the best deployment of them. So you you probably said that better than I should have said it earlier on. So thank you for that. Um, Director Kelly, did you have a comment that you wanted to make or a question? Director White has his hand up. Okay, Director White. Well, I'm not sure I got this. Yeah, um, you know, given the difficulty of, of filling the vacant position with a qualified and having a qualified person and in other positions that that's needed, I can support the, you know, the shift of funding because ultimately we're going to have qualified people in positions where they're needed. But, you know, just like on the suppression side and where we've, you know, assisted people with training up to level paramedic. I mean, I think, you know, I'd like to see the district have some focus on workforce development so that we can take an active role in developing a qualified qualified candidate pool to fill these other uh, district needs. And I know we only have so much funding and so much FTE. And I also know that this is you know, an interest uh, of the chief uh, workforce development and that he's, you know, kind of been actively recruiting for a, a college coordinator so that we can get the classes. Um, I just would like to see the district stay committed to workforce development so that we can take an active role in developing a candidate pool for the positions that are needed in the district. But currently I can support the movement of funding to put a qualified person in a position we need them uh, with the lack of having a qualified person to put in another position. Madam Chair, if I may. Go ahead. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank Chief Harms, Chief Bailey, Chief Wagaman, Fire Marshal Bardsdale for their uh, comments. And I would move the item to revise the uh, position authorization document. Has everyone had a, their chance to have their say? Director Sailors, I did have one more comment. Go ahead, Chief. Um, so I just wanna let everyone know that there is no fiscal impact to this change. It's actually $4 less to make this change than we're currently funding. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll second the motion on the floor. Thank you. Um, we have a motion and a second. Will you please call a roll? Director Gould. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. And Sailors. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much everyone for your uh, discussion and consideration of this um, item. At this time, we get to go to closed session. Thank you everyone for your patience with this. Let's see you all in closed session. Recording I'll be there in a few minutes. Having come back from closed session, um, General Law, uh, Council Law wrote and report out. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Sailors. Uh, the board met in closed session uh, with respect to the workers' compensation compromise and release for uh, employee Thomas Neville. Uh, the board uh, voted to give authority to its third-party administrator to effectuate a, a settlement of that workers' compensation claim. Uh, the board also met in closed session with its designated uh, labor negotiator with respect to the negotiations involving the employee organizations set forth in the closed session agenda. Uh, no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lavra. Moving on to reports, the president's report. I have nothing tonight. Uh, Fire Chief's report, Chief Harms. Good evening, directors. I'll have a quick report tonight. Um, over the last two weeks, unfortunately, myself and the executive staff attended two funerals. The first one was for Tyler uh, Linaham who is an officer from the Elk Grove Police, of Golf, uh, Police Department. The second one was Captain Max Fortuna from the Stockton Fire Department. We were able to attend both of those celebrations of life. 
and be able to be there and represent Metro Fire, both of those. On a positive side, uh, effective January 31st, Captain Kim Fong was promoted to Battalion Chief, and he is assigned out at Battalion 5 at this time. Um, Chief Brian Gonzalez, who was at Battalion 5, has been reassigned to the EMS Division. So congratulations to both of those folks. Uh, on a positive side, the Chief's challenge, as you heard, was last week, uh, we're able to bring the trophy back, but even more important was the amount of funds that were raised. Um, just unbelievable at over $200,000 over uh, about three and a half days. So they just did a great job and all the supportive folks that were out there. The last thing really for me is really just been around a lot of two weeks with EMS, uh, wall times, uh, APOT committees, both here locally with our regional partners, along with uh, across the state, and has been um, moving forward, uh, probably as best as we could be expected. Jeff Fry, I believe I looked and Jeff Fry is still there. Jeff is gonna give us just a little update on some political activity, both here locally and nationally. Jeff? Thanks, Chief. Um, I will do my best to be brief but succinct here. Um, to start, I'd like to note that January is typically a pretty quiet time in D.C. and here in Sacramento. Um, so some of my report will be somewhat dated back to December, but I will focus on a couple of things that occurred here in January and then moving forward. I'll start at the federal level um, with our last monthly report we received from our advisors in D.C., Holland and Knight, um, starting with the the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that was passed on November 5th. Um, we have a, a pretty good report back on uh, the highlights of that bill uh, with a focus on how it could potentially benefit fire service. Um, as we're all aware, it, it's really focused on surface transportation and water programs. We did push very early in this program um, to try to get access to these infrastructure dollars for um, fire apparatus replacement, but also station construction projects. Um, Senator Padilla was a partner in that effort and very supportive. Um, there was a decision made uh, when they were contemplating Build Back Better, build back better in Infrastructure to sp split the two issues, to take the win with the infrastructure. And the hope is still that that opportunity will come back um, again in the Build Back Better piece. Um, so we're still hopeful for that. Um, but also in my federal report dating back to December was um, um, some grant information that we're all very aware of, uh, but also an update on FEMA funding for COVID-19 response that uh, President Biden noted that it will continue and uh, federal will continue to support all eligible COVID work-related costs uh, through April 1st of 2022. Um, and the funding is available to the local, state, tribal, and uh, territorial governments. I think our challenge is, which you are all aware, is special districts are not included in the definition of local government. Um, so we continue to have conversations with um, the exec staff and, and Dave to figure out what's our strategy in getting access to those dollars, aside from what's in place through FEMA. Um, more recently, uh, two weeks ago, um, in an update from uh, member Barra's office and Matsui's office, we did hear uh, that everyone on the Hill is very much focused on the Voting Rights Act. So the Build Back Better has been put off to spring, which might be good for us strategically because that will be about the time uh, that we head back to D.C. for cap to cap. Um, so that'll give us an offer to, uh, an opportunity to meet with everybody there and really talk about Build Back Better as it relates to our needs here uh, at Metro Fire. Um, and then with that, there is very specific some proposed legislation that was back in uh, July, I think it was sponsored by AFF, called the Fire Station Construction Grants Act, which I believe Senator Padilla was trying to pair with the Build Back Better um, which would be important for us because it allows us to build reno and renovate, rebuild fire and EMS, EMS uh, facilities. Um, it included fire training facilities, which is a big piece for us. Um, but it also allowed for upgraded fire and EMS stations to meet current building codes. And I think that's big for us because most of our problems 
are around the fact that we don't meet codes, which many of you are very well with some of our conversations from last year. Um, so uh, quick quick note, cap to cap, public safety agenda, uh, steering team committee meetings are occurring. Um, we're still carrying our two papers uh, that we had in the fall through the virtual trip um, regarding federal funding and the tie to regional programs. You heard from Aaron about UASI, um, but we'll continue to support UASI, USAR, all of the grant opportunities that are available to us. So we continue to have the $15 million Fridays or, or whatever the number was from last year. Um, and then separately, uh, some issues regarding uh, related to the UAV program regulations, um, specifically local police able to enforce um, airspace control in an emergency event. Um, they don't have any um, authority to um, require residents operating private drones in restricted space and, and get them out of the airspace. And there is a nexus there related to um, some occurrences, I think about the Caldor fire where um, uh, water drop sorties were stopped because of uh, media drone use in the area. Um, so we're also kicking around the idea of supporting uh, papers related to next gen 911 because our initial intel was that that was funding for that was going to be included in Build Back Better. And then also some uh, based on information this week, um, next-gen traffic safety concerns with using AI, artificial intelligence to control intersections for public safety and Code 3 response and, and creating more safety uh, in that space. Uh, so I'll quickly pivot here to a state update. Um, most of our local policy advisors were focused on going through the governor's budget. Um, and I do have a, a seven-page uh, synopsis on that, which is real high level. Um, we're all very focused on what we see as a projected $45 billion surplus. And there's a lot of conversation at that state. I think we're actually hearing that it actually might be pushing 60 billion. Um, and we think about 20.6 billion of that is discretionary. So I think all of us at, at the local level are talking about how, how do we do get to our representatives early and often to talk about how they can support some of our local needs. Um, also noted in the governor's state budget was uh, pandemic relief to the tune of $1.3 billion uh, for the continued 22-23 effort. Again, um, working with executive staff, the, our, what we need to come to agreement on is how do we get to our state, um, state electeds to get access to those dollars as well. Um, so, uh, topics that we've been working on in the last few weeks, and this is not just me, but executive staff and many of you, um, wall times and 201 rights, fireworks issues, and wild, uh, wildfire prevention um, are topics that we've been directly involved in um, in talking with some of our um, advocates. Uh, I do want to note the Cal Chief's white paper, paper that maybe Chief Harms can elaborate on, but this is a, an effort by fire chiefs across the state that Sac County has participated in and we have directly participated in trying to highlight what the fire service did in, in the COVID response. And we hope that white paper will show how the fire service stepped up and that can be used as a leverage as a conversation started to access to some of these uh, discretionary dollars that we've been talking about at the state level. Um, and with that, all new bills being introduced in 2022 are due February 18th. Um, as of the call I took this morning, uh, staff is expecting a couple of thousand bills to be introduced. So I think we're all kind of hanging on tight. And I think, you know, phones and meeting requests and emails are going to go uh, absolutely crazy starting next week. Uh, so um, local update and working with our county and city partners. Again, we talk about the federal and state access to COVID dollars. I think that's going to come down to partnering with the county to figure out how we can do that. Um, and uh, a more kind of near and dear to my heart is the development impact fee that I have brought to the board uh, last year. And we were moving forward to updating and increasing that fee. That does have to go to the county for support. Um, we are aware that 
uh, impact fee requests from special districts have been struggling at the board as of recent. Um, so when they come, to, we believe ours will be going to the board sometime this summer. So you'll hear from me again, directors, and in hoping to get support from you at the county level uh, to make sure that um, our fee is representative of what we need to provide uh, service in future growth areas. So with that, I will end my report. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions? Chief Mitchell, operations. Hey, thanks, Chief Harm. Harms, good evening, directors. A few items here for you uh, on the COVID mm -hmm. front. Happy to report that we're down to 16 total members off as of this afternoon. 10 of those members are line personnel and six are professional staff. All 16 of those folks are COVID positive. So that can, that uh, continues our trend in, the, in a good direction for that, which is, which is really good news. Um, and I'm happy to report that uh, in the field today, we're fully staffed in operations. So that's another piece of good news there. Secondly, for our engineer exam, uh, phase two of the engineer exam finished up today. Uh, final phase uh, of that exam, phase three is the week of February 21st. I'd like to wish good luck to all those folks um, uh, moving forward into that phase. Um, and looking forward to some promotions here in the near future. As Chief Harms mentioned, uh, one of the um, items that came up recently was the untimely passing of Captain Max Fortuna of Stockton Fire, killed during a tragic incident in the early morning hours of January 31st. That morning, Stockton Fire reached out um, and asked for our assistance. I'm happy to report that we responded quickly with a task force of four engine companies and a battalion chief to assist them with station coverage during that day. And we remained in position with uh, two engines and a battalion chief throughout the nighttime hours to allow them to deal with the ramifications within their agency, um, dealing with that uh, untimely death of the captain. Shortly after, um, our Sacramento Regional Incident Management Team was requested by Stockton. And as an IC group, we approved the activation of that team to assist them further in developing plans for uh, coverage for their city, as well as a celebration of life. And then during the celebration of life on February 8th, um, we did send another task force down to the city of Stockton to station two. Um, we sent an engine, a truck and a battalion chief for a full 24 hours of station coverage. So the members of Stockton fire and their families had time to pay their respects. We also had quite a showing from um, members that uh, were on and off duty um, at that celebration of life. So, um, and then as I mentioned previous, we have Captain Matt Brevo's um, Celebration of Life occurring tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Bayside in Roseville. Uh, some statistics, we've run uh, 3,661 total calls since our last report on the 27th of January, which is down just a little bit to an average of 262 calls a day. We've had uh, just about 65% of those incidents have been EMS related with 143 fire incidents we've responded to, which averages about 10 fire incidents a day for our district. Unless there's any questions, end of the operations report, thanks. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Chief Mitchell. Up next is the Firefighters Local 522 report. Oh, you're muted. I guess I can't make it quick if I'm uh, not unmuted. <laughs> I appreciate that, President Sailors. And um, I would like to thank you for recognizing Max and, and Matt at the beginning of the meeting. I'd ask for a real brief moment of silence. Uh, local 1014 LA County Fire reported a line of duty death today. They unexpectedly lost fire captain Steve uh, McCann last night. So if we could just recognize a quick moment of silence for them. Thank you. As more information comes available, I'll be sure to share it with everybody. Um, I, I will echo the Chief uh, Chief Harms and Chief Mitchell's uh, mention of the pride that we all had in standing next to our brothers and sisters at Stockton Fire. Um, we were, as a membership, very proud of the support that we gave them. And um, <clears throat> I think that they, they recognize that. I, I spoke to a division chief who was at a loss for words when he was trying to articulate his appreciation for what our agency and our membership did for for them. So thank you to everybody that supported that. Um, we will again be standing with our brothers and sisters at Cal Fire tomorrow, um, remembering Matt Bravo, uh, like uh, Chief Mitchell said, tomorrow afternoon at, at 11 a.m. 
Um, for those that just completed the engineers test phase two, we had 37 folks move into phase two and hopefully we'll hear success rates back uh, with big numbers going into phase three. So good luck to everybody there. Uh, uh, also like Chief Mitchell mentioned, very uh, happy that we have no brownout companies today. Um, that is with multiple 522 members working down, being willing to work out of their rank and, and multiple members still on mandatories to ensure that those companies are open. So thank you to everybody who's doing that. Um, feels as if maybe we are coming out of that most recent COVID fog. I'd really like to acknowledge all the hard work that Chief Law and everybody in her EMS division has been doing to ensure that all the challenges met while we live in a, in a COVID words, uh, world still are, are you know, um, handled timely for all of our folks and to keep companies open. So thank you very much to everybody. We've had multiple members uh, assigned into that division recently, and um, I appreciate all the hard work while they get up to speed. We've had folks who have been um, working out of class and, and in extended capacities for a while that will be training them up, them up and, and working hard to ensure that there's nothing that falls through the cracks. So I'd like to thank all those folks too. Um, <clears throat> I would like to speak for a moment just to my appreciation of some of the sentiments shared by some of the board members here, uh, specifically when we were talking about the pad and some of the sentiments on finding ways to work within the budget to take care of, of the folks that are working super hard in the organization. So um, I, I recognize those statements as did some of the folks that were attendees here and, and we appreciate that. So I would also like to speak to um, the, all of the board members here that are present and, and thank you for your accessibility over the, the past really eight weeks ever since uh, I was identified as uh, having the opportunity to, to lead labor. You've been very accessible and willing to take my calls and, and I greatly appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I, I know that a, a number of board members have been out into uh, the firehouses recently and uh, the crews and, and all of us at labor really appreciate you taking time to connect with us. I have, uh, I personally was involved in a, in a couple station visits with Director Gould, and I can tell you firsthand that the crews really appreciated the time uh, that was committed to connect with them. So thank you to everybody who's connecting uh, with us at the firehouse level. Um, and before I conclude, I just, I, I want to say that we, we, um, we really do appreciate how accessible uh, you are, all, all of the board members. And, um, you know, there's been a couple of conversations that I have had with some of you that have been uh, challenging at times. And, and um, what, what I appreciate is all that you give to this board and to the agency and, and all of us in labor recognize that. And we just hope that we can continue to, um, to work together uh, and, and do what needs to be done to make this place um, everything that we know it can be and continue to be proud of. So thank you everybody for what you're bringing. And uh, I, I look forward to continuing to work hard to ensure that we can um, close some of the gaps that we have and continue to connect and, and uh, get on the same page with things. That concludes my report. Thank you, BC Cole. Next up, committee and delegate reports. Tonight, the executive committee uh, met and we approved the guidelines for um, a director to um, sit at the negotiation table. Um, it will be sent to Council Lavra for some editing. Um, next up is the Communications Center JPA, DC Wagman. You're up. Uh, good evening again, President Sailors and Directors. Um, Tyler Wagaman on behalf of the Communication Center JPA Board. We last met on February 9th at 10 o'clock. Uh, during that meeting, we had three action items. They were all large invoice related um, action items for our Westnet system, which is our station alerting equipment, our CAD system, and an interface for our Westnet system to talk to our future new CAD system through Paraton. Uh, all three action items were unanimously approved. Uh, also during that board meeting, we received and accepted a letter of correspondence from uh, CSD Fire District. Um, their general manager appointed Deputy Chief Dan Quiggle as our, their primary delegate on, on the board, as well as uh, Fire Chief Felipe Rodriguez as their alternate. Um, just a brief uh, word on some of our statistics. I had an opportunity to look through uh, the January, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the January statistics, uh, which were just finalized and looking at the calls coming in and going out of the comm center uh, or exactly the same amount of calls on average uh, that occurred during June, July, and August 
of 2021. So that pretty much gives us a good indicator of what to expect uh, come this fire season. Things are already busy, and I believe they're only going to get busier. So we're going to keep an eye on that. I'll keep reporting out on it. And our next meeting is scheduled for March 8th in a report. Thank you. Thank you, D.C. Wagaman. Next up is the California Fire and Rescue Training, JPA. Chief Harms. Our next meeting is February 17th in the report. Thank you very much. Next up, Finance and Audit Committee, um, usually Director Rosale, but um, Director Wood. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The Finance and Audit Committee has not met since we last reported out. Our next meeting will be February 24 at 530. Thank you very much. Next up, Policy Committee, Director Gould. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The Policy Committee met this evening and against uh, all odds, we kept the same leadership in place. Uh, uh, Director Gould will serve as the chairman of that Policy Committee. Uh, Delman Clark will serve as vice president and we will have, I don't think she even knows this, but we will have uh, Director Sheets serve as an alternate if she's willing, if not, she needs to advise the president so he can fill that. And for brevity's sake, we heard uh, five additional policies related to data. Uh, Matt Castleberry gave a, a great presentation only. Uh, no action was taken on those different management policies. And uh, that's the end of my report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Gould. Next up, we have uh, board member questions and comments. Um, Director Jones, what have you got tonight? Just a big thank you to all participants, board members, senior staff, members of the public, 522, uh, and uh, all the way down the line. Thanks to everyone for their professional. Thank you, Director Jones. Director Kelly. I would just like to uh, tell Chief Law that I appreciate her um, report on the uh, 911 uh, ambulance surge protection effort. And uh, I'd like to thank Joe Pick for uh, the things that he had to say. And Delman Clark, congratulations. Thank you, Director Kelly. Director Sheets. Good evening. I wanted to congratulate uh, Chief on his on his win. Uh, for the Byrne Institute and Joe Pick, uh, always just the information that you bring to the board is absolutely incredible. And the organization that you support is so valuable. Um, it's, you know, near and dear to my heart, for sure. Uh, and so I really appreciated um, that. I uh, wanted to thank Chief Law for her presentation, uh, very also near and dear to my heart. And uh, I just wanted to congratulate uh, Director Clark on his years of service. Um, it is a huge time commitment and uh, to be in this position for 15 years shows that you are committed to the organization and um, uh, representing your constituents and uh, you do it with grace and uh, poise. And I really appreciate it. And you are somebody who I'd um, emulate uh, or at least try to. Thank you. Thank you, Director Sheets. Director Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll just echo the comments that were already made, and I just want to uh, comment about uh, Captain Pick's appearance. It was great to see him out there. It's great to see Chief uh, at the challenge on Saturday morning, and uh, couldn't could yeah, just such a wonderful organization. But his stories about what members are doing out in the field are things that we need to get up at our level and do more of. We used to have a lot more recognition of our members at our meetings uh, for big saves, for going above and beyond the normal call of duty. Uh, and those stories that he had are, are examples of people that would have been great to have those crews in front of us to say thanks uh, and show our appreciation and show the community the value that uh, our members provide them beyond just arriving when we call 911. So I just, I can't implore our captains and, and the BCs out there when they hear about these things, these types of stories, to get them up, get them up uh, through the ranks so that they can be recognized in our meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wood. Director Gould. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Just really quickly, I want to echo all the comments, say congratulations to Delman and his accomplishments. Um, I echo the sentiments of my colleagues relative to his, his perspective and our board, I think, has always been rich and well valued. I'd like to end tonight with a special thanks to the men and women who tolerated my presence for a couple hours in their stations. I know that's never uh, a comfortable thing, un unfortunately, and, and yet it was uh, very heartfelt. I appreciate the time they spent with me and their openness. Um, at the end of the day, it's it's really what they do that makes all of us on the board look uh, look so good. And so I wanna thank each of them uh, and all of the support staff, you know, down to that new hire who goes gets up every day and, and goes about their work representing this organization. It certainly is an easy job in comparison to be a director when you hear all of the work that those men and women are doing. Thank you very much and have a safe evening. Thank you, Director Gold. Director White. Thank you, President Sailors. Uh, first, I just wanna wish all of the engineer candidates good luck with the rest of the process. It is perhaps one of the more, more thoroughly evaluated uh, promotional assessments in the fire service. And I truly appreciate the members who have stepped up and trained and prepared themselves for that promotional step. Um, I would like to congratulate both Chief Harms on his win and the Chief's Challenge and Director Clark on 15 years. That's quite a milestone. But last but not least, I would like to congratulate the Fire Dogs football team for a well fought victory, uh, seven to three at this year's Guns and Hoses game. Um, this was the 48th year of Pig Bull Presents. But um, this year marked 20 years of fire dog football. And so I was very happy to be down there on the sidelines with some of what we call the ODs, the original dogs, to uh, watch um, this contest and charitable event still going on. Um, really want to thank all of the members. You know, we had uh, some that just came out to coach this year. And um, everyone that steps up to and gives of their time uh, to carry on the rich history and tradition of that game. I, I just really want to give a, a heartfelt uh, thank you. And for 522 for continuing to support and sponsor that team. So thanks. Thank you, Director White. Director Clark. Yes, I would like to uh, thank everyone for their presentations. And I constantly want to tell the men and women of this organization how much I appreciate the work they do. And, and also our directors that really work hard at making, keeping things great for this organization. And thank you all for your kind words. That's all I have tonight, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Clark. Mm -hmm. um, my voice is starting to go, and <laughs> but everything every director has said was on my list of things to say. So that's, I'm just going to leave it that everyone has said what I wanted to say. So at that, I call this meeting adjourned. Thank you. Have a good night. Stay safe. We'll see you next time. It's a mess. <laughs> good night. Good night.